Good morning, everybody. How are you doing today? It's Melissa with Build a Better Bakery. Good morning, and everybody. If we've never met before, I am the owner and the main mentor at Build a Better Bakery, which is a group of coaches of which I'm the main coach and we help walk you through baking business. So if you are the type of person that wants more joy and less stress as you're starting up or growing or scaling your business, then we should hang out more. And this is what I like to do with you every week to help out fellow bakers. So go ahead and throw up your hashtag replay if you're viewing on the replay. Um, for September, we have a really interesting uh, subject, which is profitable pricing. It's something I get asked about a lot. Um, I can see anyone who is live. I can see you right here on my phone. So if you have comments, please, please put them in if you're here with me live, because I want to talk to you about this. It's a really, I get lots of questions about pricing. So this month is a big one. Get your questions in. If you're noticing that you're not currently profitable, let's say you're already selling, um, you can tell that you're not, or that you likely need to probably pay more attention to your pricing if you want to make your baking skill a real business, then this session is for you. And we're going to focus on the top three pricing mistakes. I'm going to kind of categorize them in a, um, kind of like a feeling for each category. And then I'm going to list off some examples of what that might look like. So you can see, hey, am I doing that? Or have I done that in the past? Can I, you know, can I change what I'm doing to get away from that category? <laughs> and I'll describe exactly why I feel like it is one of the fastest ways to fail a business is following these three pricing mistakes. We're going to cover them together. Go ahead and throw up your hashtag live. If you are here live with me, I see Claudia already said hello. Hey, Allie. Hey, Melissa. Hey, Elizabeth. Good to see you again. Please. I love that you're here. I know you're interested in this. So put your questions up as you think of them. Um, if I miss them, I always come back. You can also wait till the end and I'll look later or you can DM me. <clears throat> My inbox is open. So just let me know. All right. So to stay in the know about these lives before we get into it, for those of you who are new, you can check the events in the group. I usually post either the week of or a couple of weeks before what we're going to talk about. You can mark yourself as going. You'll get reminders from Facebook. You can send me a friend request to Melissa Fryer on the Facebook platform. Um, I'll accept it and you should be getting an automatic invite. If you are not, please let me know because it, the way that I set those up last, these last two events, the whole platform looks like it changed. Um, they've made some kind of update. So if you're not getting these invites and we're friends on Facebook, please let me know. Okay, you can also hang out on the email list. I send out direct replay links, but they're usually later. So you'll miss a lot of those 24-hour sales, um, the little fun things we do every week. Like there's one today, but it's only valid for 24 hours. So you will miss those if you're only looking at the replays. Or you can subscribe to our YouTube channel, which is replays on demand, but I usually post those earlier. So you could still get into those if you needed to. Okay, I do go live every Thursday at 9 a.m. Mountain Time right here. Okay, in this group, in the main discussion area. So you just show up and refresh the page until you see the live video at the top of the discussion area. Um, and we're gonna be right here in this group and just making sure that you're getting new, fresh content to help you grow whatever it is you're trying to build, right? We're here to help you with all of that. Gonna hop right in. Hey, Andrea, good to see you. Good morning, hey, Heather. Okay, <clears throat> so gonna hop right in with what seems to be the most prevalent form of pricing mistake. Again, I'm going to categorize these because there's really more than three. So I'm just going to kind of squish them into sections. And this generally affects those who are new to, newer to the industry, <clears throat> or maybe they're stuck in more of a hobby mindset. And this is the category that I'm calling wishful thinking. So some of you might have been like, oh, that's probably what I'm doing. <laughs> it's really what I see the most. And I'm not going to sugarcoat this one. I'm not going to be mean, of course. I'm not trying to hurt anyone's feelings, but I'm just going to tell you the raw truth of what this category is doing to you and your business. And I've been baking professionally for over 16 years now. I've been very deep in the industry to be able to see a lot of different business models. And I can tell you one thing. People who bake love it. It's really rare to find a person who who's baking because it was like their only option. You know what I mean? Like usually they really enjoy what they're doing. They're passionate, they're caring and thoughtful. And they're quite loving in most cases. It's kind of like baking is love, right? So we're trying to spread that feeling and that makes us feel a certain way about what we're doing. And I also know that on top of that, many people have money issues or kind of like money trauma 
that lead them to believe that making money doing something you love is wrong or that shouldn't be the case. So there is a disconnect between having it as a, using baking as a business because you're afraid or you don't feel like you should charge a living wage for what you're doing because you love it, right? Or you shouldn't be paid for your time because it's just baking, it's domestic work, whatever. There's like this, we work against ourselves when we have these money mindset problems. Those two things coupled together are kind of what makes the basis of the wishful thinking group. And I will tell you now that the easiest way to go from doing something you love for your job to doing something that's a chore that you're not really looking forward to is to make sure that you are not going with home, home with a paycheck at the end of a long week, sun up, sun down, baking, right? Like not getting paid for doing what you love when that's what you're actually trying to do. That's the fastest way to not like it anymore. <laughs> so just know you can get overwhelmed in other ways, but that's really kind of the basis of, I think, why a lot of people step back is because they're just not seeing the income for the time spent. So in my opinion, money is meant to be made through expert valuable work. However you want to, I tried to make that an open-ended statement. So expert valuable work, which I know for a fact y'all are providing. You are bakers. You know more about baking than somebody else because you're doing it. So I know that even if you're new, you're practicing. Let's say you're brand new to baking and you've baked like 20 times. That's more than some people. Some people never bake in their whole life. So everyone's on their own journey, but as you're doing it, you're becoming more expert at it. So I know you're providing something that's useful to people. And then um, what we're looking for, right, is creating that money, bringing it in via your expert valuable work, and then spending it on your family or the betterment of your life when you're off enjoying that life, right? So when you're not serving people, you should be using that like as an exchange to go do something that you enjoy. In the end, you're providing a valuable, desirable service. If you're a baker, you're not just a baker, you're providing those things. And I think many of us can agree that we would all be better off as a society and as an industry if we were paid a living wage for the time spent serving others. If we could all just agree that, hey, this seems like a good amount of money, <laughs> a living wage, and we can all be okay, right? The, the exchange of time and money seems reasonable. Now, before I hop off my soapbox on this one, I just want to say that it's not your job because I'll get the kickback of, hey, but I'm trying to like help my community. Hey, I'm trying to be affordable for everyone, all this kind of stuff. I'm not going to, you know, I help people with their businesses, but you do you. If that's what you want to do, that's your mission, please do it. Um, try to make sure that you actually truly do want to do that. You're just not using it as an excuse because you can't, you feel like you can't make enough money. So you're going to do that instead. That's another mindset thing. I believe that it's not your job to provide a deal, that's not what you're doing, and to provide the lowest pr price for a client, right? You're not Dollar Tree, you're not Walmart. That's not, you're usually not a business model, a successful business model for a bakery. I believe your job is to provide an amazing set of customer service skills and a great product experience. Those two things are paramount. So if you're providing both of those things, it's gonna be really hard to give people rock bottom prices because you wanna give them the best. You want to make a um, good impact with them. So as you are providing a product experience and a customer service experience, you're setting it at a price that will allow you to continue to provide your services at that level. So if you have rock bottom prices and really good services, that's not going to last very long because they don't equal each other out. So we have to understand, hey, if I'm going to have really good services and I want, I want to provide something great, the prices need to match up, right? It can't be Walmart prices, that doesn't make any sense. Staying financially healthy is when you get the chance to really impact your community and change the lives for the better on a consistent basis because you understand that you are profitable and you can give back without taking too much from everything else that's going on, right? We wanna be able to give back um, with that healthy basis in mind. Okay, Alrighty, so I wanna go over some examples of wishful thinking just to give you an idea of what I consider to be kind of in this group. So the first one would be emotional pricing. This is a really common one. That's why I'm starting with this. That's kind of like when you say, I feel like it should be this much. So you're not really looking at anything. It's just the inside of you says, that should be $10 or that should be $5, whatever it is. And, and you might've been around long enough to think that that's an informed decision, which if you've crunched your numbers before and you're kind of on top of your numbers, I would agree with you. 
But if you have not crunched your numbers and you don't really understand pricing and you're still using emotional pricing because it's what you feel, that's wishful thinking. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, guesstimating. So something like, well, I spent $5 on materials, so maybe it should be 10. And you're just kind of throwing out some random formula of I'll double the price and that'll be it, right? You're trying to guesstimate what you think is happening inside of your numbers. Number three is round numbers. Some bakers just say, hey, just throw five bucks on it and see if anyone buys it. That you're using fives, tens, fifteens, twenties. They're using the round number or one dollar to um, create a price. But again, there's no data behind it. Four would be fingers crossed. Okay, this is also a pretty common one, usually with people who've been in a little bit longer uh, in the industry. So this is sort of like, I kind of know my numbers. I've sort of looked at it, but I really haven't checked them in a while. I haven't updated it. I really didn't time myself on this order. So I'm just hoping at the end that I end up with a few dollars. Again, wishful thinking. And number five, I don't see this one as often, but I have met a few bakers who give me mixed signals. So I'm just going to call it the lie because you're kind of lying to yourself about it. So it's sort of like when you're acting like it's okay that you don't make any money baking because you love it, right? You're, act, you're, you're telling yourself you don't need to make any money because it's something that you love to do. But deep down inside, you really would like this to be a real job or you would really like to be validated with an income um, to either support your family or do your vacation or whatever it is that you want to do. So it's like you're telling yourself it's okay, but really truly you would actually prefer to make, make an income from it. Okay. So those are the top five inside wishful thinking. And over time, wishful thinking pricing, normally it has a pretty negative effect to it. And it usually first depresses bakers because it's full of disappointment. There's just so much disappointment going around when you're using wishful thinking. You're almost always going to be disappointed <laughs> because the numbers don't shake out. So it's like, you know, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, disappointed. Bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, disappointed. It's a, it's a cycle. And that really wears people down and it doesn't come true. You think you're going to make the money and then you don't, right? So they blame themselves though, which is kind of wild. Like they're, a lot of people tend to say, it's my fault. I didn't do a good enough job. I didn't market enough. I didn't post enough. Um, people don't like my stuff, right? There, there's all this self-blame, but I really think what's happening is you're asking numbers to work for you that don't have any basis to them. And they're not supporting the income that you deserve. They're just some number that you, that was who knows. And your work was worth it all the time. Your work is worthy, right? It's not that part of it. So if you're in this category and you're feeling that way, I want you to know that it's likely not what you're making. It's more of the value via the pricing that isn't really matching up, okay? All right. Sorry, that was a little, might've been a little harsh. I'm not trying to hurt anyone's feelings, but that's I'm trying to be, um, I hate to call it tough love, but you know, give you the information so you can take it and really soak it up. How do I know if I'm too expensive? Um, so Elizabeth, when we get to the end, so actually next week, long story short, if you don't know your numbers, then you, you need to know your numbers before anything happens, right? So knowing you're too expensive, right? So you would say, okay, how much am I profiting? Um, honestly, it's the sky, you know, you sky's the limit. You can charge what you can charge based on your, it's, it's a strategy amount. So the formula, your area, your expertise, your demographic, there's lots of things that can push and pull. Um, I feel like that question is actually a really deep question and I can't answer it right now. <laughs> uh, maybe DM me later, but at this point, there's a lot of like intricacy to knowing. I would have to know a lot more about your situation as well. Um, if you're not getting orders because you feel like your prices are too high, it might not actually be that. It might be the product or it might be the customer service or the marketing. You know, there could be other things happening in the background. So I don't want to just say, hey, prices are too high because you're not making sales. That's not always the case. Uh, we might do another session on that later. All right, let's move on to number two, which is fool's gold. This one's kind of like, I have a couple different analogies in here, but again, this is another section. Um, for what I think are the number two biggest pricing mistake. And when it comes down to many things in life, I think we can agree that copying doesn't really work out too well. Like it's not, 
it's not authentic. Um, it's not going to help you have a unique expression. Uh, it also makes sure that you're kind of trying to fit into, let's call it like someone else's jeans, right? You're trying to fit into someone else's jeans, but they probably don't fit too well because they're not really made for you. They're too tight here. They're too short here. You're trying to squeeze them on, but you're like, this isn't really working, but I don't have any, you know, maybe I don't have any other jeans or I'm not sure where to get jeans or whatever. So in this case, I'm calling it fool's gold pricing because it's when you're relying on outside influences rather than your personal information to determine your pricing. And it looks good from the outside. Like, hey, this fool's gold, right? Like that looks great. They look like they're successful. They look like they're doing well, which honestly you would never know for sure. A lot of people aren't, okay? <laughs> they look like they are, but they're really not. And so, hey, I should use their pricing, right? Because they're doing well. Again, fool's gold situation. So let us not forget that their jeans, their prices won't fit you. They're not made for you. Don't be fooled by what you think their success is because we don't know what they're doing. We don't know their bills. Your bills are never the same. The answer is never yes, you're never the same. So taking someone else's prices doesn't make any sense. Now, likely I suggest, or I, I um, imagine that people subscribe to fool's gold pricing because either they determined that pricing is this solid structure that cannot be changed within the industry. So they're just saying cupcakes are $2, period. And that's just the way it is. Which simply, in my opinion, is just a lack of knowledge about pricing strategy and in the industry itself. Um, that might be common in other industries. Baking isn't really that way because it's a self, it's a it's a service provided usually by a person or a small team. It's not like a retail product that's created in a factory. You know what I'm saying? It's, just, it's a different, um, it's like more artisan. So there's a lot more pricing variance that can happen. So it's either that or they don't have the ability or desire to crunch the numbers. Some people really just don't want to do this. It's, it's just they hate math or they haven't been able to really figure out a formula that works or they tried it and it didn't work before with a different formula whatever it is, they just don't want to do it. So instead they ask someone else or they copy a number they saw somewhere else. And in an attempt to create a race to the bottom, some people may even deliberately undercut another baker or a location just to say that they're lower priced. And this is a sales tactic. So as I mentioned earlier in this last um, section, when business comes to business, there's all shapes and sizes. And I'm not here to judge anyone. I'm just telling you what I think I would do, how um, what the longevity of decisions that you make, et cetera. So if you're that person who did the undercut pricing, um, I personally wouldn't do that. There's some, because there's some psychology behind why I wouldn't do that. Um, but if you did, I want you to know that I can say that all of these tactics plus that one, it's still not going to yield a profitable pricing structure. So yeah, maybe you're getting a few more sales because you're, you know, taking them from the other the other groups because you're a little bit lower, but that's still not profitable pricing. Um, so that's why I've added it into this section. And it's not something you can understand or rely on if you haven't crunched the numbers. If you're just trying to undercut, again, it's it's almost like you're choosing to give yourself less money just to get the order, but why? <laughs> you know, like to me, I I, I wouldn't. Um, it just, it's a lot of work. We know that baking is a ton of work. So we got to make it worth it a while. Um, and again, in, in all of these cases, someone is using outside influence rather than internal, internal data to determine that price point. So that's like using the wrong numbers in a math equation. You knew that you put the wrong numbers in because you found them somewhere sitting on the table somewhere. You put the numbers in and then but at the end, unfortunately, you have to take full responsibility of whatever those numbers equal. And it's in real life with real dollars. So it's like actually a real thing. And that can be pretty depressing as well, or um, can actually take a business down because they just didn't plan for it. And then here we are, and now they don't have any money, and they have all these employees to pay, and they have rent to pay, and they have insurance, and they owe these taxes, and there's just a lot of stuff happening. Um, you would be surprised how many people start businesses without actually creating real prices or profitable prices. They just pull numbers. Uh, so please, if you are doing this, please consider something else. I'll talk about number three. Now, some examples of fool's gold pricing, just to kind of see where you're at, would be one, checking a competitor and copying their prices. Two, checking a competitor, 
competitor and dropping just below them or raising just above them. So you're still just using their price as an anchor. Three, asking people on the internet what they charge for X, which happens in every baking group ever, basically. Those people can't help you. <laughs> they can maybe like tell you how much they, they, they like make an hour or they can tell you like how much their bills are that they're paying. But the X number is something that doesn't, it's not useful to you, okay? And then number four, looking at online stores and copying their prices. Again, anything online is so far removed from anything local to you. So that would also not work out. <laughs> it won't work out. There are so many factors to pricing itself, as well as pricing strategy that we talked about a little bit. The strategy, the psychology behind it, the value ladder that you would build. There's other things that happen inside of pricing as a whole. And that's like a whole other subject, right? We're not even talking about one plus two plus three anymore. We're talking about how the price is built based on other influences, like your market, your experience, your demographic, your um, product niche, all of that. And so when you're trying to run a profitable business without ever having crunched your own numbers, speaks to that first category of wishful thinking, actually. So they're kind of tied together. How would you ever know just how much of that $5 cookie is coming home with you rather than being fed back to the business? How would you ever really know that unless you've crunched the number? And how could you plan a successful sales month, how many cookies to make, how to sell them, et cetera, without knowing that number by heart? So it's, it's hard to plan anything if you don't really know that. Your unique profit numbers can assist you in things like branding, menu development, menu choices, or venue choices, event bake lists, sales strategies, value ladders, scaling, new product development, etc. like basically everything. <laughs> so it's super, super important. Okay, number three, category three is too late, too little. This is more so where I see people end up when they are really excited to open their business and they want it to be successful, but they kind of fall short. They kind of like give up or they decide, eh, I don't really want to do that right now. I don't want to mess with crunching the numbers, <clears throat> et cetera. Or they had someone tell them something wrong. So when many bakers decide they are worth that time and effort to get in there and crunch those numbers to have their business set up for success, they sometimes get caught in this little too little too late trap. It's a shiny option though. And I think that's why a lot of people gravitate towards this where you'll have a, I'm gonna call it a quote formula in place, but it doesn't account for many hidden costs and or the numbers generated are still guesses rather than being closer to an exact number. Now, are we gonna be penny to penny? Maybe not, you know, but if, if it's a guess versus like an actual mathematical calculation, those are two different numbers. This often happens when that ba when bakers receive a poor recommendation from a culinary school, which I'm hearing a lot about. Um, another baker telling them something, they wrote a blog post, they Googled it, whatever. And they're simply not aware that things could be better if they just shifted their formula to be more specific. So many of these people, and again, not trying to hurt anyone's feelings, Many of these people feel like they're probably doing okay, but they're noticing that, hey, I thought I was making, I thought I would make X. And then when it all shook, shook out, I didn't. Why? What's, what's eating at my profit? They don't know what it is. Like, is it this? Is it that? Is there a weird bill that I didn't notice? What's happening, right? Every month or every couple months when they're running their numbers, they're thinking, this isn't really working. Why? That's this group. So having a strong, thorough, protective pricing formula. So hitting some bases that are wider than just a couple little pieces to the formula is one way to remove a lot of stress and surprise in your business. So surprise isn't really great for business. We want to avoid that. So having a more thorough formula is how you do it. Some examples of weak formulas are one, materials times three. This is the one that for some reason is getting sold in culinary schools. I don't know if it's just trying to help someone like quickly come up with something. Um, I, I don't know, but it's very vague. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't account any data. I don't know why people are being told to do this, um, but it doesn't really ever, it's not, it's not reliable. Um, so that's what I would call a weak formula. 
Two would be materials plus time, which is also a really popular way that bakers tend to charge for their services. But oftentimes it's a not accounted for well, um, the time spent, or a living wage is not being applied. So they say, hey, I spent eight hours on this, but I'm not gonna actually you know, charge a living wage for those hours. Hello, $5 hour workers, you know, the ones who make $1.50 an hour, you know who you are, <laughs> that kind of thing. And missing all other aspects that the background noise of your business, we need to account for that kind of stuff. Number three would be a formula with no future costs accounted for. Past and future, those are things that I cover in my formula. So what's happening is you're thinking about everything that's surrounding your business. How can I plan for things? How can I cover things? And how can I do this in a succinct price so that my business is paying for itself and I don't have those surprises? So this could be no separate profit area, no savings area, um, no thought of an IRS tax <laughs> until it shows up at your door, that kind of thing. So note that anytime you're missing a category from your formula, one of the only places that extra business costs can come out of would be your personal income because everything else is doled out, right? Everyone else gets their pay. Everyone else gets their bills paid. At the end of the day, it's your income that the extra stuff's coming out of. So we really, really need to protect that number and make sure we're accounting for all business costs so that doesn't happen. Now, after talking with many, many bakers, thousands of bakers, probably hundreds of thousands at this point, about pricing, since we started back in, we started Build a Better Bakery back in 2018, I can firmly tell you that almost every baker that I've spoken to who feels they have pricing problems would love to be paid well for what they do, no matter which category they're sitting in right now. That's something that they want. It's a desire. And when it comes down to, hey, why aren't you doing it? Or what's standing in your way? I hear a lot of self-esteem, access to a formula that makes sense, which is something I can help with, or setting aside the time to crunch the numbers. That one is something you're gonna have to figure out. <laughs> you have to decide that it's actually worth your time. I can help you with a formula and I can even help with some self-esteem, which is something we're gonna talk about in a couple of weeks to round out September. So those are the three things that I see standing in people's way most of the time. So I personally was able to build a six-figure business baking and inside the baking industry using a five-part formula that I cover, that will cover past, present, and future costs. It's that thorough um, enveloping model for a formula. And as part of this month, covering profitable pricing, I will be delivering a description of this formula in the session coming up next Thursday. So the event information is already up in the featured area. So if you want to mark yourself as going now, you can do that if you like, and then you can, I will describe each part of the formula verbally, just so you understand what I'm talking about. Pricing profitably, it's an art, right? It's something that we have to get better at, we have to learn how to do, and understanding that process that you'll be working through to get to that profitable pricing status is just one part of it. Just understanding, hey, here are some steps that you're going to have to work through to get there. And I will be here every Thursday at 9 a.m. Mountain Time to share more information on pricing through September. Let me look at the comments. Heather says, I have a spreadsheet of all my costs, ingredients, packaging, et cetera. How often do you suggest I update it, especially with prices of groceries going up so quickly? Um, she says, to be clear, I know the cost of my individual cookie to the gram, and I also price each item that I sell. I'm just not sure how often I should check it to make sure I'm still profitable. Okay, so Heather, great question. And I agree with you. I mean, the whole egg egg debacle, right? Like the pr food costs are, have been volatile. I feel, and I mean, I'm not like super old. I think I'm, I think I'm 37, but I've been buying groceries long enough that I feel like over the last like five years or so, things have really ballooned um, and have been going up and down. Like egg prices are really low now, like almost lower than before it feels like, it, at least where we, we moved to a new state. So it might be that, but um, I agree with you that it is something that we need to look at. So for me, what I do is I look at what I'm spending on a monthly basis as my base, like business running costs. 
which often don't change, but sometimes can change if I'm like adding a new part to my insurance or, you know, I upgraded my website or <clears throat> whatever it is. So I have those numbers and I check those every month just because they're pretty easy to find the information. As far as like something as straightforward, but tedious as grocery clock costs, if I were to be really, really, really strict, I would do it once a month. If I were to be like less strict, probably every three months, if I were to be pretty calm about it, but hoping that I'm not losing a lot of money every six months, and then once a year, if you are, if it's not that super important to you, or you're not really noticing a lot of shifting. Um, so having a spreadsheet with all those numbers on it, just by itself, and then just going to the store and taking it with you, if you can, or photographing the prices, you can do it that way. If you order online, you can just check it online and that's really fast. You might also be able to check prices online for your store that you usually buy from, um, which would be even faster too. It sounds like you probably already do that. But yeah, I would suggest one to three months is like a good, if you really want to stay on top of it, I would probably do that. So in the middle, maybe two months <laughs> and um, just see how much it's changing. Maybe do it every two months for six months and kind of and, um, average out the differences kind of see what, what, what's the average change. And that might also help you um, plan for the future. If like, let's say you miss a month or something like that. Um, but really like a whole year of data will give you the best, um, the best averaging information, especially since prices tend to shift a lot on certain products over the, uh, over certain holidays. Um, you know, you know what I'm talking about, all the different items that go on sale, over the holiday or get more expensive because they like to do that. <laughs> so that's what I would suggest. Hopefully it's not too confusing. Okay, Heather says, I'm, in, I'm Canadian. A package of butter is eight to $9. Yeah, so yeah, Canada, um, I don't know. I do have a couple elites who are from Canada and they did say that their butter is super expensive. Not sure what that's about uh, exactly, but if that's common, then yeah, staying on top of any... You could, you know, another thing you could do is you could look at your ingredients, pick like your top five ingredients that you use all the time and are maybe like volatile. So butter, um, for me, it would be like butter, sugar, flour, eggs, um, vanilla, maybe something like that for the top five. And you could just check those every month or something to kind of see, hey, you know, could I be losing a lot of money? Because the more you make, the more you could lose. So if you have a really high volume business, definitely staying on top of it. Um, you could even look every time you order stuff. If you have like an inventory and you're ordering through, a, um, like an economy, um, like someone who ships to you or something like that. So that could, that could be another way to kind of stay on top of some of it, at least to see if you can see market changes. Food tripled in So we, so Andrea, we just moved from California. Um, we've been in Texas for two months. I honestly feel like we spend more money here, even though they said it was going to be like lower living costs, but I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't feel like it is. Um, I'm sorry that that happened. Tripled. Yikes. $14 for butter. What? Stop it. It was like four or five when I left. That's crazy. Andrea says, says she evaluates prices after I see the product prices change in this. Absolutely. Absolutely. So sometimes Baker, like depending on your schedule, you might not have time to sit down and look through everything, but yeah. So what she's saying is the minute I notice there's been a change, I'm going to, I'm going to evaluate at least those top categories. Like if baking soda, do we need to evaluate that sprinkles like right now? I don't know, you know, but the big ones Let's definitely take a look at those. You're welcome, Heather. Thanks for asking. Yeah, vanilla. <laughs> yeah, vanilla's like. Uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I always feel like I know it's weird. But I feel like I'm buying like drugs or something off of it because it's like everything's normal price. Then I go to the vanilla and it's like a hundred dollars. <laughs> like, whoa, settle down. <laughs> yeah, it depends. Yeah, we're in El Paso. Um, I feel like it's kind of, some people said it's not even Texas, like it's more like Mexico or it's more like New Mexico. Um, still getting used to it. I don't really know for sure. And I've never lived in either of those other places to know. Um, but I do, I do hear it's like kind of isolated. Like there's not really a lot going on around it. So it could be that. 
Elizabeth says, I use Kate Cost for pricing. Is this a good app to use? I had some bakers suggest it to me. So <clears throat> this is also a good question, Elizabeth. I personally do not use um, digital apps for really anything, specifically because I want to know what's happening. So if I plug stuff into their algorithm, they're kind of like, you know, they magically calculate this number, but I feel like for me, myself, I need to know what is, what's the math, like what's happening with this. Um, I have not looked at Kate Cost, like I said, I don't use the app and I do see it recommended a lot. So I can't, it, it would be hard to believe that it wasn't a very good product because a lot of people use it. Um, if you want to come to next week's session, <clears throat> I'll tell you the five categories that I have in my formula. And then if you want to go to the cake cost and see what they're doing, it's possible. Like I've actually not seen an app <clears throat> or any person teach the five categories that I use because I do, I'm expanding it to past and future costs to really protect your income. Um, I just don't see other apps doing that likely because it's data crunching and it would ask and ask you to have to get some data in hand. Maybe they, maybe that's just too much for them. But my goal is to make sure that you're successful day one and you don't have to like backtrack um, or play catch up with those other costs in, in mind. So if you want to come next week, see what it is, go to the Kate Cost app, see what they have. It's might be, I don't know the app, but it might be possible to like add in something extra maybe. So if you decide, hey, like I'd rather, I'd like to charge something for this thing, I'm going to add it in. So maybe you could do that and then keep the app itself. But I think just truly understanding how pricing works first and then going to the app would probably help you feel a little bit better that the numbers coming out look right. Um, because I don't know what their algorithm does. So that's my thought on that one. Alrighty, so uh, to recap real quick, wishful thinking, if you're in that category, let me know. <laughs> Uh, fool's gold, right? So wishful thinking is like guessing, emotional. I'm not really using any numbers. Um, I hope I make money, but I don't know if I will kind of thing. Fool's gold is like borrowing other people's information to try to make money because you think they're successful or you don't have a way to create a number. So you just need a number. So you're going to use a number, but it almost never works out because it's not your information. Number three, too little, too late. So using ineffective formulas, wondering why you're not profitable, even though you have a formula, not understanding where the money's going kind of thing. Okay. So everyone can have that in case. Now to round out the session, make sure you put your questions in if you have any before I head out for the day. Um, I did want to say that what I, what I plan to do for September is I appreciate everyone coming live. And I know some of you are gonna view this on the replay, which is great. I wanted to do a um, 24 hour sale on the pricing course that I have in stock. That's like a recorded course up on the website. I wanted to do a 50% off sale for 24 hours after every session, because I think that if you're willing to come to these sessions, you must be interested in this kind of thing. And I'm willing to cut the price to make sure you can get it. I'm also willing to do a money back guarantee on it. So if you don't love it, you have a period of time to get your money back, no questions. I wanna to try to get this into people's laps during this season because we're about to head into the holidays and I want you to be more profitable during that because that's a lot of bakers fall off January, February, March because they didn't, they worked their butt off over the holidays and they didn't make any money and then they quit. And that's not what I want for you. So that's why we're doing this. We have 24 hours to go in to the website, get a sweet deal on the pricing for profit course. It's half off. It's exactly what you'll need to get yourself geared up to understand and really use a profitable pricing strategy. It walks you through creating your own chart. There's lots of information. You can go to the curriculum to read through everything that we talk about. I walk you through each page to get your information together. We do the calculations together. Um, there's even some mentorship added to it as well. So if you're working through, pop in, ask me a question. I do weekly uh, coaching sessions in the mentorship. So you can just, if you're working on it that week, pop in, hey, I didn't understand this page or hey, what can you look at my chart? That's fine too, that's why it's in there. Um, so again, it's guaranteed to impress you with useful information. Hey, get your money back, girl. 
poor guy. I'm not, I, I'm not here to steal anyone's money. I'm here to help you. So what you can do is apply code week two. I'm actually going to put, I'm going to put the link in the, um, I'm going to put the link up for you. You're going to apply week two at this link and you will get your discount. Um, so go ahead and grab it if you'd like to. It is going to be, it's only 24 hours though, because I don't like leaving my coupons open for too long, those discount coupons, I need to shut them down. So we're gonna do 24 hours after every session in September. It's valid, this one is valid through Friday, September 15th at 11 a.m. Go to that link and you can use it. You can also hop over to the website at buildabetterbakerynow.com for a variety of other support options like mentorship services. This pricing course that I mentioned is up there with other different courses. Um, downloadable business plans, contract templates, things that you might need to just grab and go instead of having to spend hours and hours and hours trying to figure all this out. It's already on there, so you can just download it. Uh, we also started a new Patreon page, which is something that was asked for, and I created some special mentorship packages for patrons, so it's a different vibe <clears throat> than the other stuff that's on the website. So if you haven't looked at that yet, you can go click on it and see what the packages include if that's something you want to check out. Uh, if you'd like to browse our ultimate pricing bundle, it's a little different than just the course. It has extra support. So that could be something else that you might like. You can DM me for the link to that. You can just find it under the coaching options on the website. And lastly, if you are curious about a commercial space or a timeline to open one, I am releasing a new course soon with a ton of great info that can help you survive your transition from cottage to commercial with that less stress, more clarity, understanding what needs to happen, what's going to happen, et cetera. Or if you're just going straight to commercial and you're skipping cottage, you can still use the information. <clears throat> we just talk a little bit about transitioning from cottage to commercial if you already have that business. So you can DM me, DM me to get on the wait list or even comment here, wait list, and I'll just send you the link. It's free. It just lets you know when the, when the course launches. You get an extra bonus and special pricing for those who um, want to get in the course first. That's why we send that out. Okay, let me double check your questions. I'll put a post in after this to show it all so I can get some opinions. Sure, I invested into QuickBooks and it helped me know what's coming in and going out. Absolutely, yeah. So Andrea uses QuickBooks. Um, we actually have a code that's in the um, on the website. I have like contacted some of the bigger uh, groups that help bakers keep bookkeeping and canva and all that kind of stuff and i got codes from them to put on the website so i don't know if andrea can still use it but if you're want to do something like quickbooks or um i don't know if you can retroactively apply it or not i think you might have to be a new customer uh but there's a code on there to save you some money so it's in it's at the can't remember exactly where that is i think it might be in the um i can let you know <laughs> it's either at the very bottom of the website or it's in the resources i think it says like um affiliate discounts or something like that. So you can see if there's anything in there that you might want to use, and then you can just apply to whatever, whatever it is they gave me to put up there, you can just apply it on your site. Melissa says, I'm wishful. Yeah, but so Melissa and I are friends. We actually know each other in real life. And I know that she's wishful because she absolutely loves baking. She wants to take care of people. That's her personality. And so I think sometimes we get stuck in, we feel like we can't love it and make money at it at the same time. And that's really just a mindset thing. Um, and a lot of people are wishful. It's very common. Okay. I'm not seeing any new questions come through. So I'm going to head out for the day. I'll be here with you next week to talk more on profitable pricing topics. We're going to cover those five sections of the formula that I use. I'm just going to describe to you what they are so that you can understand why I've included them how they can help you, and then you can go from there. You can use it yourself. You can get into the course so I can show you how to use it. You can apply it to the formula you already have. Um, maybe it's just going to give you some ideas of how you can be more profitable. Whatever it is, I'm here to help. So I'll be here next week to share that with you so you can understand where I'm coming from with that formula and how it can be a benefit to you. You're welcome, Claudia. Okay. All right, y'all. I hope you have the best day. I will see you later and stay safe out there and yay for pricing. It's an exciting topic. Okay.